Hey, I'm Pam, and today I'm ranking some more video games. So today I'm going to be ranking all of the Sierra and LucasArts point-and-click adventures that I've played, sort of the big two original developers for the genre. I do plan on talking about some of the other um, companies and other games uh, at some point, but I just wanted to confine it to this, otherwise the video would be way too long. So I could have sworn that this was voted second in the poll I put up on my Patreon asking what rankings people wanted to see, but I just noticed before sitting down to record this that this was actually third. So the second choice, which was Metroidvanias, will be next, but this is what I'm prepped for now. So this is a nice category in a way because there's really no quibbling about what belongs in this category, um, whereas with CRPGs or things like that, there's, you know, some discussion about whether the game qualifies. Here, it's pretty clear. Was it developed by Sierra or LucasArts? Is it an adventure game? Then it fits into the category. So that is nice. Now one thing that does complicate things in terms of rating is that a lot of these games had multiple iterations released. So for example, it could have been released first uh, with EGA graphics, and then a couple years later they produced a VGA graphics version. Or it might have come out first using a text parser, and then a year or two later they did it with the new interface using the point and click. So it's really going to depend on which version I played, even though there may be multiple available. Um, and then just something to know about me and my preferences, I don't really like text parsers, though I sort of caught the tail end of them. The first adventure game I ever played used a text parser. Once the point-click interface came out, I really preferred that and really had no patience for the text parser. So that's definitely going to be impacting my rankings here. Okay, so we've got our tier list up here. I think everyone knows what the categories mean. S is like best in the genre or best in the category. F is a complete failure and the rest are somewhere in between. I've written down them in chronological order, roughly if they release the same year, I'm not. I haven't looked up specifically which came out first. So I'm going to start uh, at the beginning in 1984 with King's Quest One. Uh, King's Quest was one of the most influential games created by Roberta Williams. It's really what created the graphical adventure genre. It was not her first game. She did some text-based adventures before, even starting to bring in graphics. But I'm pretty sure that King's Quest 1 is the first game that ever had an avatar that you're actually controlling um, and walking around the screen. So hugely influential on everything that came after it. That said, did I enjoy playing it? I really did not. Again, I don't like text parsers, and this is a game I played later on. Um, it's at that time where the colors were just really ugly, the sound effects were just ear-piercing. Uh, I remember when I started playing it, the first thing I did was just like walk into the moat and die. Uh, it, it's not fun to control. I, the puzzles are really kind of out there, um, especially a few of them. So I definitely respect how important it was and how without it, a lot of these games probably wouldn't even exist. But I have to rate it on whether or not I like to play it, not how historically significant it was. So I'm going to give it a C. And that's actually giving it bonus points for being significant. <laughs> So next up in 1987, was there really nothing that I played between those years? Uh, is Leisure Suit Larry One, created by Al Lowe. It's about a um, lovable, question mark, uh, loser who is out to lose his virginity. He wears a white polyester leisure suit. Uh, these were the sort of adult games. You had to do little trivia that apparently children wouldn't know uh, in order to get into the game to actually play it. The first one came out, it was obviously a text parser. They did a remake a few years later, I think maybe in 91, using the point-and-click interface. I've played both of them. I think the Leisure Suit Larry games are fun. They're often funny, but often not. Just a lot of sort of 
sexism, casual homophobia, things like that. A lot of the humor is at the expense of Larry, but also at other people's expenses too. So, it's not a bad game. It's interesting. It was definitely um, a bit of a product of its time, but it's still fairly fun to play. I played all the Leisure Suit Larry games um, quite a bit later than when they actually came out. So, I can give Leisure Suit Larry a B. It's just more fun to play than um, King's Quest, I think. And with the point-and-click interface especially, it's pretty amusing, and some of those death scenes are quite funny. So, we'll go on to the next one, which is Maniac Mansion, a game I got in a package of LucasArts Adventures, one of the earlier games I played. Spent a lot of time with this. I found it pretty cryptic um, in terms of how to get around, but again, it was quite funny and it was enjoyable to play. Uh, it's got those um, tentacles that are hilarious that appear in another game. So I'm going to give Maniac Mansion a B as well. Not my favorite of the genre, but uh, definitely, definitely a good time. So moving into 1988, we have Leisure Suit Larry 2, uh, looking for love in several wrong places. And something about Sierra games, which has always bothered me, this, ha uh, this applies to most of them, is that you can not just die, the deaths are sometimes often funny, but you can get to a dead end. So you can get to the end of the game and be told, oh, you didn't pick up something half an hour ago, and you'll just lose. And that is what happened to me when I played Leisure Suit Larry 2. I got to the end of the game, which is on a volcano, and you needed an airsick bag from an airplane, and I didn't have it. And then it was just like, well, fuck you then, hope you have a save. And that made me so angry, and even though I probably had saves, I just was mad and felt disrespected and didn't want to play it ever again. So even though this is something that can happen to you in a lot of Sierra games, it happened to me in this one, and I don't like it, and I'm giving it a D. If anyone has ever said I'm not driven purely by spite, they are wrong. <laughs> So next up, we've got Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, the second game I played from Lucasfilm. Um, it uses the Scum engine, just like Maniac Mansion did, and it tells the story of aliens who are trying to make humanity stupid, and the people trying to prevent that from happening. And it's an interesting concept. It is on the humorous side, as you would expect, but there's just a lot of annoying things in it. Like, there's a lot of copyright protection in it where you have to be referencing the manual in order to progress. Um, anytime you want to take a, a flight on an airplane, which you do a number of times during the game, you need to uh, put in codes found in the manual. And there's a lot of mazes in this game, and mazes are really like bottom of the barrel for design, uh, for good design. So I don't particularly care for Zack McCracken. Uh, definitely wasn't one of my favorites. I found it very difficult to get through and uh, just quite cryptic. And now if I can find it, there it is. I'm going to give Zack McCracken a D as well. It's just not, not one of LucasArts or LucasFilm's uh, best outings. A game I liked much more is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, a adaptation of the movie, obviously. And this game does have some problems too. It has some, I know there's at least one maze in it. Some of the puzzles are pretty cryptic, but it's an excellent adaptation of a movie. I mean, we're used to so many video games based on movies or shows being quite terrible and this, in this case, it's it's a good one. It's There's so many scenes that like directly correlate to what you see in the movie. And um, when I was playing this game at this age, I was watching the Indiana Jones movies and the Star Wars movies just like a ton. So I really liked seeing this brought to life on my computer as, you know, a way to let me control Indiana, Indiana Jones. There's also some combat in this which people probably have mixed views on, but it was an interesting way to sort of spice things up and make things more exciting. And I think, despite some flaws, it did a really good job of um, adapting the movie. So I'm gonna give 
Indiana Jones A, B. So we've got more Leisure Suit Larry. Leisure Suit Larry 3. I think this is Patty and the Pulsating Pectorals. Is that what it called? it's called? Yes, Leisure Suit Larry 3, Passionate Patty in Pursuit of the Pulsating Pectorals. I do like that these titles always have alliteration or usually have alliteration in them. Um, I... This was the first adventure game I ever played. I was over at my aunt's house and I saw that she had a computer and I asked her if I could play computer games. And the only one she had was Leisure Suit Larry 3, which was probably inappropriate for me at the time, but is one of the things that kickstarted my interest in adventure games. I remember going and one of the first things you do is you look through some binoculars and you can see a woman changing in the in the window. She's like just got boobs out, which was pretty exciting being like a seven year old or whatever and not having seen many boobs before. So I think this was an interesting one. I, I honestly remember so little about the game other than that beginning, um, but it did really get me into the um, point and click event. Actually, it wasn't even point and click. This was a text parser one. So it did really get me into uh, adventure games in general. So I'm gonna give this one, uh, I don't know. I wanna give it a higher rank just because of its responsibility, but I, I'm gonna give it a C. Um, again, don't, don't love text parsers, don't really remember anything other than the beginning of it. I feel like most of my good feelings are just based on that little bit of nostalgia rather than um, any actual quality of the game. So moving on to Quest for Glory 1, which is sort of tied for my favorite Sierra series. Um, you'll notice on this list, I don't have any space quest or police quest, um, but Quest for Glory is a series that I played the whole thing through. Um, 4 was the one that introduced me to it, but then I went and got the others. Quest for Glory 1, and I am talking about the VGA point-and-click version, which is what I played. Um, I didn't play the text parser version at first. Uh, I think it's a really good game. It's a very strong start to a new series. It has good puzzles. It's non-linear. There's like three main quests you have in the game, and you don't have to complete them all. There's like you can just go right to the end and defeat the bad guy and there can still be some sort of mysteries left unsolved and you can go back and do that again next time. Um, it's just got a really interesting world to explore and lots of funny sort of death scenes and amusing uh, characters and quips and things like that. So I think that Quest for Glory 1 is a really good one. I'm gonna give it an A. Next up, we've got King's Quest V. Uh, this is actually the first King's Quest game I ever played. I played the talking CD version, and it's not my favorite. Uh, compared to all the other adventure games I was playing, it didn't really vibe with me that much. I found Cedric incredibly annoying. I found a lot of the puzzles difficult to solve. There was also some sort of reaction-based things you need to do, like you needed to not just solve the puzzle, but solve the puzzle quickly in order to progress. So it's not my favorite of the point and click adventures. I'm gonna give this one a C, mostly because of Cedric. And then we have Loom, a beautiful, beautiful game. I made a docu-retrospective review video on it a while ago um, that you should watch if you haven't seen it. It's really nice. The um, the art is beautiful, the music is beautiful. This is one of the few games where I find that the EGA version is just as nice, if not even a little more nice than the VGA version, but they're both quite strong. Uh, the VGA has really good voice acting. It is on the shorter side, which I don't really mind, but it could have definitely been expanded a little more just to like really stick the landing on the story and the characters and getting you to like really buy into them. But it's really interesting. It uses a completely different interface than most of the other Lucasfilm games were doing, even though I'm pretty sure it used the Scum engine. But I'm gonna give Loom a B. 
So Quest for Glory 2 is the only one of the series that I played with the text parser. I don't believe it got a remake like the first one did, at least not until a number of years later. I still haven't played it. But this time you go into sort of more of an Arabian setting, and it has some good characters, and it has its um, good points, but it also has some really annoying things, like there's a sort of maze-like thing you need to do anytime you're traveling through the city, which just wastes time and doesn't really add anything. I remember a puzzle right near the end of the game where you need to remember the name of someone that someone mentioned in a conversation in passing that was like a real kind of a real roadblock for progressing through the game at that point. So uh, I don't particularly care for um, Quest for Glory 2. It's probably my least favorite of them. So I'm going to give it a C because it's still it's still decent. I still really love that um, combination of the adventure and the role playing, but it's it's my least favorite of the series. So now we've got the Secret of Monkey Island, which I think is one of the best point and click adventure games of all time. It has great puzzles. It's hilarious. There are so many great characters and situations and just the humor really hits still to this day. It's also got some of the most beautiful pixel art I've ever seen, at least in the VGA version. Uh, just really great, great game. Um, one of the most memorable for me as well. It's probably the first adventure game that I finished, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, I'm giving Secret of Monkey Island S tier. I just uh, really think it's sort of the top of all of them. So now we're in 1991, and we have Leisure Suit Larry 5, there is no Larry 4, and that's actually the story for this game, um, sort of tracking down the missing tapes. I forget, I should have put, put the real, um, I should have put the full names of here. Passionate Patty does a little undercover work is the name of this game, and I think it's one of the weaker ones, it does, there is quite a jump, like this goes into the point and click interface, much nicer graphics compared to the first few games in the series, but it's quite linear and the puzzles aren't particularly good. Um, it's, there's just not a whole lot to do in this game and the story doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so yeah, this isn't my favorite. I'm going to put this in C. And then we have Monkey Island 2. It's amazing to consider that the sequel to Secret of Monkey Island came out only a year or so later. That's that's crazy to me. Um, so Monkey Island 2, very much like the first one, a lot of great humor and characters, absolutely beautiful artwork. But it has something that's become a pet peeve for me in games, and it'll come up in, in other ones as well, is that I don't like that this game takes place on multiple islands. I just find like the travel is a waste of time. So you'll do something on one island and then you need to go to the dock and then you need to travel to the next island and then you do things there and then you travel back. And I just find those, it's, it's not even that much. It's just a couple extra screens, but it's just like a couple extra steps every single time. And you're island hopping back and forth a lot, especially when you're first playing and you don't know what to do. So I don't like that. Um, that kind of ruins it from being S tier along with the secret of Monkey Island because I do, in terms of the story and the puzzles and the humor, think that it's on the tier with that. It's just that one little thing making me put it in A tier instead of S tier. So now we're in 1992 and we have King's Quest VI. This was co-directed by Roberta Williams and Jane Jensen, who would go on to make the Gabriel Knight series. And I actually just played this, like I just finished it yesterday. Um, honestly, I wanted to have more King's Quest uh, games in this ranking, so I, I played this and another game. Um, and I quite liked it. It's got decent voice acting. It does do the same thing though with multiple islands, so every time you want to travel you need to go to a beach and use the map and travel to the island, so I don't particularly like that. There's also a bit in the middle, which I really don't like, which is climbing 
like 30 stairs with puzzles in between that was just really annoying. And then that's, t that's followed up by a maze, which is also really annoying. But if you were to take that part out of the game, it would be like really good. It would be one of the top tier games, I think for me. But because of that, I'm going to put this in B? Yeah, I'm gonna put it in B. It had an interesting um, design that I really liked. I liked the puzzles. I like how sort of whimsical the King's Quest are and based on like different fairy tales and things. But just a couple of those little design things that just kind of irked me as I was playing. So yeah, B. And then we've got Quest for Glory 3, Trial by Fire, I'm pretty sure is the um, subtitle for it. And I really liked this one as well. This time you're going to a sort of African styled continent and you are helping the people there. I thought this was a really good game. I liked the combat in this one a little more than in other games of the, in the series. I also thought it was really interesting how the different classes you could be impacted uh, the progress of the game and the types of puzzles you'd be facing throughout. So I'm going to give Quest for Glory 3 an A. Uh, yeah, I think these games hold up pretty well. Like they're still pretty fun to play. Um, whereas some of the other ones I've talked about feel like I can feel their age. These ones are still, still really fun. Moving on to 1993, we have Day of the Tentacle, which is the follow-up to Maniac Mansion. Um, we meet the tentacles from that game, and they're trying to take over the world, and you're playing multiple characters and going through multiple different um, time periods. Again, very funny. I really like the sense of humor. It looks good. It still does that thing where there's not islands this time, it's different time periods, so you're jumping between them a lot, um, which just... It just feels like a waste of time to me. I don't like it. But other than that, the game is very good. I just played this for the first time a few years ago, but it is a very good game. Not on the island of Monkey... Not on the um, level of Monkey Island. I'm gonna give this a B. And now we've got Lost Secret of the Rainforest, which I believe is part of the EcoQuest series. Uh, it's the only one of that series that I've played, but you're going to the rainforest and seeing sort of environmental destruction that's being caused. You've got this cool little like camera computer device and you're taking pictures of different animals and different trees and things, which is uh, something that I really liked when I was playing that. I always like when photographing things is a mechanic in games. Uh, it's it's a fun one. I think the puzzles are pretty, not easy, but they, they make a lot more sense than puzzles in adventure games often do. Um, it doesn't have the sort of story or humor to like put it into the top ranks, but I still think it's a pretty good game. So I'm gonna give it a B. And then we have my other favorite Sierra series, Gabriel Knight. And after the success of King's Quest VI, uh, Jane Jensen was given the chance to make her own series and she wanted to make a more sort of adult and darker uh, take on the adventure game. So she made Gabriel Knight a struggling uh, writer who finds out he is descended from a long line of shadow hunters. And I just played this again not too long ago. I still really like the game. Uh, Gabriel's definitely a bit of a cad, and there are some things that haven't aged as well. Uh, but I really like the puzzles, I really like the New Orleans setting and the sort of supernatural feel of it. I'm gonna give Gabriel Knight an A. So now we've got Quest for Glory 4, which as I said was the first game in the series I played. I fell in love with this game when I first played it. Uh, the voice acting was brilliant. The graphics seemed like such a huge step up over any of the um, adventure games I had played before. Um, you know, it doesn't have that beautiful um, detailed pixel art of like the portraits in Secret of Monkey Island, but just generally like the backgrounds and the characters and everything. Just really well done. 
um, very non-linear. You can do things um, at different times. And again, what class you're playing really um, has an impact. There's also a ton of references to things like old film noir and things like that. I uh, just really loved this game. I know it had problems when it first came out. There was a lot of bugs. Luckily, by the time I played it, it was sort of a fixed version, so I never had to worry about any of that. So I'm going to give Quest for Glory 4 S tier. I do think it is one of the most fun, still to this day, adventure games out there. Here's Lily, here to give her opinion. Hi, baby girl. All right, so what do we have next? Uh, 1994, King's Quest 7. I, this is a controversial one, it seems. A lot of people did not like the direction that King's Quest took for 7. Um, it sort of changed the graphical style completely to more like brighter, sort of Disney style graphics. It also changed the interface, so then rather than have like the four or five verbs, um, it just had a responsive cursor that would react in a way that made sense rather than having to pick. Um, a verb to interact with things. I really liked this. I liked that it had two female protagonists that you sort of switch between. I particularly liked playing as Valenice as I found the environments, environments that she explored were just absolutely beautiful and the characters that you met were funny, occasionally annoying, but they were funny and I love the conversations. And actually now that I'm thinking of it, the end of King's Quest VI and the end of King's Quest VII are very similar in certain ways, but uh, I, yeah, I really liked King's Quest VII. I think it's a bit underrated and harshly critiqued, but I'm going to give it a B. So 1994 also had Laser Suit Larry VI, Shape Up or Slip Out, and I don't remember a ton about this one. I I do know that it got to a sort of more grounded story than the previous one, which had like spies and things. This was just Larry in a resort trying to meet women. And I remember liking it, but I also don't remember all that much about it. So I'm going to put this one in C, just sort of because I don't recall all that much about it. I'm pretty sure I just played it the one time. Now we're into 1995 and The Dig, which is a very interesting game with a very cool story along with its development. I made a video on it, um, check that out if you haven't watched it. But The Dig is very um, ambitious in its storytelling. It's really impressive in terms of its environment and its soundtrack. It does have some puzzles that are really quite awful but it also has some good puzzles and I just really enjoy the scope of the story, even if at times I find it, the writing a little bit on the dull side. Um, I just really like the sort of space epicness of it. I'm having a hard time figuring where to put this. Like I, I sort of want to like it more than I actually do enjoy it. So I think B is a good place for it. It definitely, tries some really cool, interesting things, and it only sometimes accomplishes them. But I just find that the whole setting and atmosphere is really, really good, and it kind of makes up for the faults that it has. 1995 also brought us Full Throttle, which is about a motorcycle gang. Uh, you are the leader of one, and you're framed for murder, and it's a very sort of cinematic kind of game. It is on the shorter side, which usually isn't that much of an issue for me, but it does seem to be over quite quickly. I think Full Throttle, again, the, the ambition of it is cool. There's motorcycle combat and things like that. Uh, it doesn't quite rank up there with the best ones though, so I'm going to give this one a... a mm, I'm going to give this one a B as well. So 95 also brought FMV into Sierra's world. 
And the first one that came out was Phantasmagoria. It's the first one of Sierra's games that use this new technology. And I know that Roberta Williams was super excited to do this. I think this is her favorite project that she worked on. And technically, it is quite impressive, especially for an earlier FMV game, even though I do think other ones did it better, like Under a Killing Moon, which I'm pretty sure came out beforehand. My problem with Phantasmagoria is it's just really boring. Um, they've filmed all of these scenes and they just don't take into account how long they are and how much time you have to spend watching things over and over again rather than actually playing the game. Like, there's, there's not that many puzzles in this. Um, and it's just sort of a lot of really dull cinematic scenes and weird tonal shifts. So Phantasmagoria is just not a game I enjoyed playing at all. I didn't play it until, I don't know, five, six years ago. I made a review on it back when I did, but I just did not like this. <laughs> uh, so I'm giving it a D. But on the other end of the spectrum is Gabriel Knight 2, The Beast Within, and I'm surprised that these came out in the same year because they seem to have learned so much about FMV and designing games around it between the two that um, just Beast Within is better in so many ways. Like it's shot better, um, the interaction versus cutscenes are just much more better paced and better integrated. It's got a really interesting story, it's got so much. Uh, sexual tension and everyone just does a really good job in it. There's like a history component to it and then there's the normal puzzle solving and yeah Beast Within is one of my favorites from Sierra in total. I'm just, do I want to give it an A? I think I'll give it an A. I, yeah, mm, yeah I think A is fair. It's, it's like almost S rank for me but uh, yeah Beast Within really good A. Now we're in 1997 and The Curse of Monkey Island. It's been a number of years since Monkey Island 2. I just played this one as well. I just finished it a few days ago because I uh, wanted to put it on this ranking, but I also have the big box and I don't like having big box for things I haven't played. So Curse of Monkey Island, I was always a little um, hesitant to play it just because of the change in art style. But my fears were completely unfounded. It still has that great Monkey Island sense of humor. It's got voice acting this time, and the voice acting is just perfect. I'm pretty sure when they did the remake of one, they used most of the same voice actors. Uh, it's hilarious. It brings back insult sword fighting, which is one of my favorite things from the first game. And the puzzles are really a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, just more piratey goodness. I'm gonna give this one an S tier as well, I think. I think it was a very, very strong game and fun to play even as a brand new player. So 1998 brought on the penultimate LucasArts adventure game, which is Grim Fandango, and it is the last game of theirs that I've played. This one got hyped up a lot. It's not something I played until about five or six years ago, and I really like the setting and I really like the characters and the whole concept of it, but I don't like playing it all that much. I wasn't a huge fan of the puzzles in this one. I found that just the way the rooms or screens were designed often made me miss that there was an exit. Like a lot of the time I was getting stuck just because I didn't know that I could go this way off to a new screen. So I'm sort of torn on this because like aesthetically, it's very, very cool, but I didn't really like playing it that much. So I'm gonna give it a B, just so no one gets too angry at me. That's a lie, I don't do things so people don't get angry at me. But yeah, I wanna like it more than I actually did, but the, the atmosphere keeps it in a B, whereas the gameplay would might have taken it a little lower. Oh shit, I noticed I've just missed something. Laser Suit Larry 7 was actually 1996 before Curse of Monkey Island. This is probably the Laser Suit Larry game I've played the most. It has really nice cartoony graphics. It's absolutely ridiculous and over the top. 
There's a mini game called Find Dildo where he's dressed like Waldo and you find them and he like does a little dance and dances off screen and it's absolutely ridiculous. And I, th I found this game quite amusing when I played it. I liked the puzzles. Um, I liked the sort of takes on real characters and how it renamed them to be um, to have a lot of sexual innuendo. So I like Leisure Suit Larry 7. Um, it's probably my favorite of the series along with one, so I will give it a B. All right, back to 1998. At this point in time, adventure games are not doing so hot. They're not selling as well as all of the shooters. Uh, companies are trying to adapt to it and um, go in a different direction. Sierra is really just barely hanging on with their fingernails based on some uh, business moves that didn't go too well for them, as well as the adventure genre not doing well overall. So everything goes into 3D at this point, and that isn't great. <laughs> so first we've got King's Quest Mask of Eternity. It takes King's Quest and you don't even play Graham or any of his family. I think you just play like some peasant boy. And it's just really, really ugly. It's really, really focused on combat. The combat isn't fun. I remember getting this and being so excited and playing maybe 20 minutes before just like turning it off in disgust. It's just an ugly game. It is not a fun game to play. Mask of Eternity is getting the first F. So then we've got Quest for Glory 5, which handled its transition to 3D better than King's Quest did, but is still not very fun to play now. I remember liking this game when I first played it. I really like the setting. This one goes to more of a Greek setting, so you've got like gods and goddesses and all sorts of that mythology, which I really enjoyed, um, especially as a teenager. And I liked the story and some of the things it did, but I tried to replay this a couple years ago and I just found controlling it and the combat really just not fun at all. And I, I didn't continue my playthrough because it just mechanically wasn't fun to play. So uh, where is five gonna go? I'm gonna give it, uh, I'm gonna give it a D. That seems, um, unfortunate, but yeah, it's just, if I don't even want to play it, then I can't really give it a better score than that now. So our final game on this list is Gabriel Knight 3, Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned. And if there's a game that defines mixed bag, it's this one. Its move to 3D was not very successful. Uh, it's just really, really ugly. All of the characters look terrible. It has some of the worst puzzles, the infamous cat mustache puzzle, but also one of the coolest puzzles um, in the very riddle heavy and game spanning puzzle of uh, Le Serpent Rouge, which is really, really interesting. It's got a cool story that Jane Jensen was inspired by a sort of very pseudo sciencey uh, book about uh, religion and she added some vampires to it just for that poor, that poor paranormal aspect. And yeah, it's, oof, I don't even know. Interesting story, really ugly. It also had tons of technical issues. I know to this day, people still have trouble actually getting it to run. I'm giving this a C. Again, one of those things like has some real high highs, but also has some real low lows. So I feel like that's a, that's a fair place to put it. All right, so that is all of my rankings. Let me just increase this screen here so you can get a little better look at the final rankings for everything. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I think I like the sort of standard curve I tend to have with all of my ranking videos, so yeah, this has been fun. Let me know in the comments if there are any rankings you disagree with, if there's any LucasArts or Sierra games you recommend I played that I haven't. Uh, let me know what your personal S tiers are in this category. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.
If you want to see more, I've reviewed a number of games that I talked about in this video. If you want something positive, check out my review of The Secret of Monkey Island. Or if you're looking for some snark, check out my Phantasmagoria review. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.